بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد الله بلا ظلم يولد ولا بكل رحمة أحد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب شرح السدري ويصل لي أمري وأحل الفقدة من لساني يفكى وكولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته May peace, blessings and mercy upon my Chia Allah be on all of you. The topic for today's Pri Kutba talk is Religion in the proper context. Religion, according to the Oxford Dictionary, means a belief in a superhuman controlling power, especially a personal God or God which deserves worship and obedience. Today, I am speaking about the major religions that is Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism and Islam. I would like to take the help of one of the verses from the Quran, from Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 64, which says, Kul ya ahel al-kitab, say, O people of the book, ta'ala ila qalmitin, sawa in bayna wa ilakum, come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na ta illa Allah that we worship none but Allah. Wala nushika bihi that we associate the partners with Him. Wala yatqiz abaz wa abaz and arba wa bidunillah. And then we erect among ourselves Lord and Prayer other than Allah. By tawallah, if then they turn back. Fakulu shadu. We are not Muslims. Say we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa taala. We have to come to come in terms as between us and them. The common term between all the major religions is that all religions believe that the God they worship is the same for the whole of humankind. The Christians believe that the God they worship is for the Christians as well as for the non-Christians. The Hindus believe that the God they worship is for the Hindus as well as for the non-Hindus. Similarly, the Muslims believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the worship is for the Muslims as well as for the non-Muslims. So let's analyze the concept of God in different religions. First, coming to Judaism. According to Prophet Moses, who came upon him, he said in Deuteronomy chapter number 6, verse number 4, Shama Israelu at Naila Hayu at Naihat. That Jehovah is right. The God, our Lord, is one Lord. And he also said in Deuteronomy chapter number 5, verse number 89, that thou shalt not make any graven image of any likeness of anything in the heaven above, on the earth beneath, on the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, not serve them. For the Lord, our God, is a jealous God. So according to Judaism, we have to believe in one God and should not make images of God Almighty. If you read the Old Testament, you will understand religion in the proper context. Before I describe the concept, of God Almighty in Christianity, I'd like to make a few points clear. That Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus may peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus may peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe that he was the Messiah translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention which many modern day Christians do not believe today. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born and blind and leper with God's permission. We are going together, the Muslims and the Christians. But that is part of our faith. Many of the Christians believe that Jesus Christ may peace be upon him, he is God Almighty, he is God incarnate. There is no 
single verse in the whole Bible where Jesus Christ baptized upon him. He himself says that I am God or worship me. In fact, he said in Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 17, Think not that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. I have come not to destroy but to fulfill. When one of the scribes asked him, which is the first of the commandments? Jesus Christ will be before him. He replies in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verse number 29, that the first of all the commandments is, and he repeats verbatim what Musa had said, Shema Israelo, that your way right, the Lord. Our God is one Lord, same as Kul Allah Ahad, same is Allah one and only. <coughs> if you read the Bible, you will understand Christianity in the proper context. <coughs> if you ask a Hindu who does not know much about his scriptures, that how many gods does he believe in? Some may say three, some may say a hundred. Some may say a thousand, while others may say 33 crores, 330 million gods. They believe in a theory called as pantheism. It means everything is God. The tree is God, the sun is God, the monkey is God, the snake is God. We in Islam believe that everything is God's. God is the apostate S. Everything belongs to God. Meaning, the tree belongs to God, the sun belongs to God, the monkey belongs to God, the snake belongs to God. So the major difference between Hinduism and Islam is the apostrophe S. Yes. If we solve this difference, then the Muslim and Hindu will be united. If you want to understand Hinduism in the proper context, we have to read the Hindu scriptures. If you read the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, it mentioned in chapter number 7, verse number 921, verse number 1921, that all those who I worship, all those who worship the God, they are materialistic people. Only materialistic people, they do I worship. The Vedas happen to be the most sacred of the scriptures of the Hindus. <coughs> it's mentioned in the Veda, chapter number 3, verse number 32. Natasya Patima Asti, it's a Sanskrit quotation. Natasya Patima Asti, of that God you cannot make any images. <coughs> the same in Veda, chapter number 32, verse number 3, it says, God has got no image, he has got no body. Again, in the Veda, chapter number 40, verse number 8, it says, God is formless and bodiless. The next verse, chapter number 40, verse number 9, says that all those who worship the Sambhuti, that is, the uncreated things like water, air, earth, all those who worship a Sambhuti, they are in darkness. And the verse continues. Andhatma Pavishanti Ya Sambhuti Mupaste. Andhatma means darkness. Pavishanti means entering. Sambhuti are the created things. They are more in darkness those who worship the created things. If you read the Hindu scriptures, it also says, Ekam Brahman. Dostya Naste, Niya Naste, Naste Kinchit. Eki Bhagwan hai, Tusra Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Zarabi Nahi hai. There is only one God, not a second God, not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. If you further read the Rig Veda, which happens to be the most sacred of all the four Vedas, it's mentioned. In volume 2, chapter number 1, verse number 3 to 11, that 
God Almighty has got 33 different attributes. We in the Quran have got 99 different attributes for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Rig Veda, volume 2, chapter 1, verse number 3 to 11 gives 33 different attributes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the attributes is Brahma, meaning the creator. If you translate that into Arabic, it means Khalik. We Muslims have got no objection in calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Khalik or the creator of Brahma. But if the Hindus say that Brahma is God Almighty, who has got three heads with three crowns on top, you are going against the Ayurveda. We do not accept the definition of God Almighty. Another attribute given the Rig Veda is Vishnu, meaning the sustainer, meaning Ra. We Muslims have got no objection in calling God Almighty as Ra, as sustainer, or Vishnu. But if you say Vishnu is God Almighty who is traveling on a bed of snakes in the sea with four hands, we have got objection. You are also going against the Yajur Veda, chapter 3, verse number 32. If you follow the reading of the Veda, it is mentioned in volume 8, chapter number 1, verse number 1. March the Yadi Santa, all praises is due to him. Alhamdulillah, all praises is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, in the same Rig Veda, <coughs> volume number 6, <coughs> chapter number 46, verse number 16 says, Ya ik it mushtihi, there is only one God. Worship him alone. Kul wallahu ahad. He is only one. So if you read the Hindu scriptures, you will understand Hinduism in the proper context. <coughs> if you ask the Muslim, what is the definition of God Almighty, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the best answer he can give you is from Surah Ikhlas. Chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Kul wallahu ahad. Say he Allah one and only. Allah is Samad. Allah, the absolute eternal. Lam ilay balamullah. He begets not, nor is begotten. Wala wa kulla wa kuffan ahad. And there is nothing unto him like in this world. This is a four line definition given in the Quran of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you read the Quran, in the Quran there are 99 attributes given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like Rahman, Rahim, Kareem, Malik, Quddus, etc. And the crowning one is Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 110, Qurdullah Amin Rahman. Ayyamaktatu, follow Asma al Hasna. Say, call upon Allah or call upon Rahman. To him belongs all the beautiful names. Call him by any name. To him belongs the most beautiful name. So we have got no objection as long as the name is beautiful and it does not conjure up a mental picture. But we Muslims give a crowning name as Allah. Why do we prefer calling God Almighty as Allah instead of the English word God? Because the Arabic word Allah is a pure word. It cannot be played around with. For example, the word God. If you add S to God, it becomes Gods, plural God. There is nothing like plural Allah. Allah is only one. You can't make a plural of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you add E E S S to God, it becomes Goddess, a female God. There's nothing like female Allah and male Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got no gender. If you add a father to God, it becomes a Godfather. He is my guardian. There's nothing like Allah Abba. You can't add a father to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you add mother to God, it becomes Godmother. There is nothing like Allah Ammi or Allah Mother in Islam. 
Again, stored in the English language and be spelled with a small G and a capital G. <coughs> capital G is God Almighty. Small G means a fake God. In Islam, there is nothing like capital Alif and small Alif. Allah is unique. If you add tin to God, it becomes a tin God. It's a fake God. There is nothing like tin Allah in Islam. That's the reason we Muslims prefer calling God Almighty by the word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now if you analyze and ask a normal person what does he mean by the word religion? He will say it is a code of rituals. In that context, Islam is not a mere religion. It is a deen, a complete way of life, a complete code of life. As mentioned in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 3, verse number 19. In Nathina in the Lahir Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. But if you analyze the basic teachings of all the major religions, they speak good. All the religions, including Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, all the major religions say you should not steal, you should not rob, you should be honest, that you should not molest, that you should not rape, etc. etc. Islam teaches the same. So what's the difference between Islam and the other major religions? As I said, Islam is a complete code of life. A complete way of life. <laughs> Besides, talking about the good things, it shows you a way how to achieve that goodness. A practical way how to achieve that goodness. For example, all the major religions, they say you should not sleep and you should not rob. Islam says the same. But Islam shows you a way how to achieve that state. According to Islam, every Muslim who has a saving of more than the Nisab level, more than seven and a half tons of gold, more than 85 grams of gold, if he has a saving of more than 85 grams of gold, he should give a two and a half percent of zakat, of charity, of that amount, every lunar year to the poor people, compulsory. If you want to give more, you can give in the form of Satka, Lilla, etc. But minimum, 2.5% Zakat obligated charity. If every individual in the world adopts the system of Zakat, poverty will be eradicated. And there will be no robbery. In spite of a person, even though he's rich, still if he robs, what solution can Islam have for that? The Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 38, and as to the person who robs, may it be a woman or a man, <coughs> cut off his or her hand as a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If anyone robs, chop off the hands. I am asking you, let many non-Muslims say, that Islam is a ruthless religion. Islam is a merciless religion. It's a barbaric law. And they think that if you go to Saudi Arabia, every second person you come across will have his hand chopped off. <laughs> Believe me, I have been to Saudi Arabia. I did not come across a single individual whose hands were chopped off. Surely, there will be quite a few people whose hands are chopped off, but it's not as common as they feel it will be. I did not come across a single person. <coughs> I would ask the non-Muslims, if you apply the Islamic Sharia law in America, which happens to be, which happens to have the maximum rate of crime, if you apply the Islamic law of zakat and the Islamic punishment of chopping off of the hand of the thief, will the rate of crime, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? <coughs> but naturally it will decrease. 
Let me give you an example. <coughs> All the major religions, they say that you should not molest, that you should not rape and leave. Islam says the same. But Islam shows you a way how to achieve this state. Islam has the principle of hijab, which is mentioned in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30. First, it speaks about the men. It says, O oh, believing men, O oh, believing men, lower your gaze. Lower your gaze and protect your modesty. That if any man sees a woman with an unashamed thought or a brazen gaze, the Quran says, he should lower his gaze. And the next word speaks about the hijab for the woman. It says, O oh, believing woman, lower your gaze and guard your modesty. And display not your beauty except what is that necessary of. And draw the veil, draw the head covering over the bosom. Except in front of your husband, your father, your son, and the big list of Mehra, the close relatives who she cannot marry is given. Besides these people, she should wear the Islamic farda, the Islamic hijab. If every person, every individual in this world follows the Islamic hijab, <coughs> will the crime increase, will it decrease, or will it remain the same? Yeah. I'd like to give you an example. Let's suppose two beautiful twin sisters, they are walking down the road. Both are equally beautiful. One wears the Islamic hijab, completely covered, and the other wears the western clothes of a mini or a short. And if they are walking together, and there is a ruffian, there is a hooligan, waiting down the corner to tease the girl. <coughs> Which one will you tease? Will you tease the girl in the Islamic hijab or the girl wearing short or mini? But natural, he will tease the girl wearing short and mini. Even after Islam has given you the broad outline of the dress code and lowered it again, in spite of that, if anyone commits rape, <laughs> what solution does Islam have for that? <coughs> Islam says that you should chop off the head of the rapist. Capital punishment. Non-Muslims say it's a barbaric law. Today, in America, on an average, 1,900 women are being raped every day. On an average, every 1.3 minutes, one rape is being committed. Last week, I attended the conference of the Indian Medical Association, and there, one of the speakers said that in this country of South Africa, every minute, one rape is committed. I want to ask you the question that if you apply the Islamic Sharia, will this rate of crime increase, will it remain the same or will it decrease? <laughs> but naturally it will decrease. So Quran says that when you speak with everyone, non-Muslim or Muslim, follow the guidance given in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125. Udu <laughs> Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom. Well, more with the hasna and beautiful preaching. What does the Lord bring that the Asan and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious? Wa'afir da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.